in our gospel reading from John, we have a story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. It's a scene right out of some independent movie that is defying the norms of Hollywood. The central figure, once again, turning convention on its head. During supper, Jesus gets up, gets some water, gets a towel, and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. What seems like an, just an interesting act, a curiosity, you know, one of the many stories of Jesus that we're going to tell 2,000 years later was an act of spiritual revolution and cultural and societal upheaval. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only act of spiritual revolution and cultural and societal upheaval. Jesus has many of them. However, for some of the acts of Jesus, the passage of earthly time and the evolution of societies may have taken away some of the shock value that we have. You see, every society has its rules. Some written, some unwritten. And every society has some hierarchy. Every society has some written and unwritten rules about who does what. Small groups have rules. Big groups have rules. Some are written, some not. Here's an interesting example. When the Supreme Court is having deliberations in the room in private, it is the newest member who has to get up out of their chair and go to the door when something, somebody is knocking. So when snacks are delivered to the Supreme Court, the newest member has to go to the door and open the door. So what used to be Brett Kavanaugh's job is now Katanji Brown Jackson's job to go to the door. Every group has some rules. I, I don't know if that's written down. I'm pretty sure it's not in the Constitution that the newest member has to go to the door, but it is a rule. The norms and practices of Jesus' time made the act of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples very out of place and very scandalous. In first century Palestine, walking, primary mode of transportation. So you're walking on dirt roads, essentially with sandals. So feet were exposed to nature and had to, you know, all nature had to offer and they were calloused and rough and they were just probably just downright gross. Okay. So having one's feet washed was no doubt something that was a treat and welcome. Maybe not the equivalent of a modern pedicure. Washing the feet was usually the job of a servant who was often a female servant. So let's assume that in the social situation outlined on what we have from John, that there were no servants present to perform this act. We don't know this to be the case. And I'm not suggesting that Jesus would have had a servant do it if there was a servant present. So let's say there were no servants available. Out of Jesus and the room full of disciples, what would the norms of society dictate should be done if foot washing was going to be done? It wasn't going to be Jesus. It wasn't going to be Jesus. You know, maybe they'd apply Supreme Court rules and the newest disciple would have to do it. But it wasn't going to be Jesus. So in this social situation, Jesus takes the hierarchy, throws it upside down, Jesus is the master slash teacher, wouldn't be the one. A student would do it. So we've established the radical nature of what Jesus is doing. As he takes off his outer robe and he gets the necessary things to do the foot washing. Now, as wild and interesting as this is, we're going to add in one more little fact. Judas is present. Judas is present. And the text doesn't tell us, tell us that Jesus decided to skip over Judas. The text doesn't tell us that Judas was outside the room when this happened. 
Judas doesn't leave till after the foot washing, after they go back to the dinner table. Judas is there. So Jesus also washes the feet of Judas. The one that's going to betray him. The one who is suffering from Satan taking over his heart and soul. That one. That one gets washed by Jesus as well. Jesus doesn't banish him. Jesus washes his feet. Even though he is the one who is going to betray him. So, what does that tell us? What does that tell us? It tells us that no matter how dark your soul may seem, no matter how many times you have let evil into our hearts, no matter how much we have not followed Jesus in our life, Jesus is still there, ready with divine towel in hand to clean our soul, to restore our hearts anew in love. The love of God, the grace of Christ, the patience of the Holy Spirit know no boundaries. There's always more for our infinite God to give. Finally, let's turn to the loudest and fastest voice of the disciples. Peter. Peter expresses a bit of confusion as to what's going on here. Because when Peter sees Jesus is about to wash some feet, Peter comes in and says, Well, no, we can't have this. You're not going to wash my feet. Got a little bit of defiance. Not out of the ordinary for Peter. Not out of the ordinary, but Peter's a little defiant. And I can imagine Jesus telling him, probably in a calm voice, no, Peter, um, I need to wash your feet because if I don't wash your feet, you're not going to be part of what's going to happen. So, I can imagine if this was a cartoon, Peter would have a little light bulb blink on on top of his head and go, oh, this foot washing is important. Now, it wouldn't be the right light bulb, mind you, but it would be a light bulb. And he said, oh, well, if the foot washing is great, well, let's do the hands, let's do the head. And once again, we have a little bit of missing the point, and Jesus tells him, no, that's, that's really not what this is about. You're, you're clean. You've taken a bath. It's good. I need to wash your feet. There's bigger symbolism going on here. So, Peter had gone in, you know, an odd direction. One that said, well, it must be the washing that's the important thing. But you see, Jesus was trying to explain that this washing was a little bit more than just washing. This was a symbol of what needed to be done. Because at the end of this, Peter did not see, you know, oh, excuse me. So at the end of this, we see that Jesus tells his disciples that, you see what I did? I washed your feet. You see what I did? Now, you all know that That's not normally how it's done, but that's an example for you. So what should you do? Well, you should wash each other's feet. Now, we don't have a situation where the people that were present, the disciples that were present, went and said, oh, well, what we've got to do now is we've got to add another section to the law code that says you should wash each other's feet. You shouldn't do it any other way. Because that's not what Jesus was trying to say. Jesus was trying to take a specific action, an action that everyone knew about, show an example, and then show people what they are to do. Now, if that was not enough, because it probably wasn't, it probably wasn't enough. After Judas left... We have the disciples coming back, and Jesus is telling them once again, but this time in both a bigger and more important way, and perhaps in a plainer way, that 
to understand what he was doing with the foot washing, to understand the bigger picture, and to make this so significant, he issues to the disciple what he calls a new command. Now we've got something to add to the law. But actually, we have something that the law already had. Something that brought life, which is what the law was supposed to do when used. A new command that Jesus is giving at this time is the summary of all the commands. It's the summary of what God is all about. Jesus tells his disciples, he tells us, he tells anyone who will listen, I give you a new command, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should love one another. That's what the foot washing was all about. This is the mark of the followers of Jesus. This command is the mark of a Christian. Follow this command of Jesus. 